Okay, so in the interest of time, and we have to move quite swiftly, I'd like to introduce Carol Mock, who's Senior Value Engineer at TIPCO Software. Uh, TIPCO obviously has been around for, for uh, a, a long time and has been known as a connectivity platform. The um, differentiation that it has, um, we're going to talk about today, is, is how to create an ecosystem and economy using the data that comes from from platforms out there, whether API driven or MQ or whatever it is. So uh, with that, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Carol, who's been 20 years experience in designing strategies um, beyond the industry conventions, uh, specifically for financial services. So Carol, if you would like to uh, introduce yourself and, and carry us forward on this, on this journey of ecosystem economy. Thank you. Great. Great, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so hello everybody, happy to be here at API Days. Um, today I'd like to share with you some of my ideas in the world of this um, ecosystem uh, economy that um, has emerged. And it's a very appropriate time right now. I think this week there was a recent announcement with Citibank, uh, which they had um, indicated that they're pulling out of 13 markets in Europe and Asia. And at the same time, there's some news around Gojek and uh, Tokopedia, which they are um, planning to move towards a merger or towards a new entity called GoTo. So it's quite an opportune time in terms of this presentation. And my topic would be around how FSIs can win in this new API ecosystem economy. And a bit about me, um, I'm not a technologist or a developer. I think the engineering name may be misleading here, and I don't own an API program. Um, but I am a value engineer at TIPCO, and um, I, in layman words, um, I occupy this sweet spot where I connect the dots between the discipline of um, human insight and psychology, um, and connecting that to the possibilities of what technology do, can do um, and the role of the brand can play in terms of contextualizing that back into a story and the fabric of where it's, it's situated in consumers' lives. And this is where value is created in terms of new growth opportunities, new innovation opportunities, and these things translate into um, a customer experience. So in context of this conference, um, which is about APIs, APIs have been a key enabler in unlocking um, assets and capabilities into connecting to existing systems and data within organizations. And it's been a big drive in terms of feeling this new um, era of growth for us. Um, so whilst these APIs have this uh, huge promise in doing things that are, you know, better, faster, cheaper. It's very attractive in being new and shiny. At the end of the day, um, I think from my background and discipline as a researcher and a marketer, I'm always looking um, back in terms of that technology of how does that connect back to a human need, um, a human frustration, a pain point that they have, and then translating that back into some tangible value. And that's what's going to give competitive advantage in terms of these new services um, that are that will be created. Um, as I said, it is an interesting time, and I think this last year um, is quite unpre unprecedented in, in what's transpired around the world. Um, but particularly when we look at the online user base, um, the entire po population of California has gone online. Um, and that's quite incredible when you think about this completely new user base that um, are trying out many of these new digital services for the first time. Um, these people are on their training wheels, um, utilizing their moda mobile device to access and buy things online. Um, um, through online ordering, um, banking online, insurance investing, um, or even uh, picking up in Southeast Asia remittance services. Um, and so with the adoption of these, these online services, um, when we go back, reopen again, um, consumers still uh, um, intend to stay with these new applications. And so what we've done with this, huge population that's come online, they've now whetted their appetite 
um, to these types of services through the mobile device and it's becoming an essential ingredient in their daily routine, in their habits and behaviors. So with that growth, um, it's been largely concentrated by people that have current bank accounts and they're realizing that this whole new wave of doing things through your mobile device um, is providing them with great convenience, um, this frictionless experience where you have this one-stop um, device to do everything. Um, there's even better products that are available and a better way to communicate with your bank and um, having access to transparency as well as managing some of the risks in terms of um, conducting their banking transactions. Um, so it's really rising, you know, new possibilities for, for uh, these consumers to do things in a way that they haven't had um, access before. And so this uh, super app is at the center of it. I think many of you in the audience are familiar with these. Um, if you're based in Singapore, you would be familiar with uh, Grab or Gojek. I don't work for these companies, so I'm not endorsing them. But um, what it says at the end of the day is that, you know, if you started today um, and you've hailed a cab on this uh, app, um, you've gone into the office, um, you've ordered lunch uh, through the app, and you might have now then gone through the app again and done a, a grocery order, or then done some further exploration of maybe planning a, a staycation for the weekend or catching up with some, um, in this particular app, and investing options and just checking out what's what's happening with the latest and greatest in, in stocks. So the beauty of it all is this one-stop device has become your go-to place to do everything. There's no need to go to multiple portals. Um, and it's just providing a great deal of um, convenience uh, that might have existed before in a linear relationship when you had to deal with multiple providers. So behind the scenes of uh, the super app, that interface that you see is these um, ecosystems. And these ecosystems are really um, disrupting um, product categories and brand categories. Um, what it means is that now these um, super apps and these disruptors are operating in multiple spaces um, with consumers and expanding around their consumer needs. So it's really about catering around the consumer experience, their needs and their key um, buying occasions or their key moments in their lives where they uh, are engaging with brands in that way. And that's how... Um, brand equity is now now built um, rather than uh, before when you have the, your traditional banking relationship, it's around centered around the bank itself. So instead of going to the branch um, or the ATM or now even through your digital device, consumers are choosing and opting to go through their own entry point, which is the consumer need that they have, uh, which can be anything from um, shopping or shopping uh ordering food uh planning for growing their wealth but it's not about um it's not about uh, the product the bank's product category itself and this is how consumers are going to navigate these decisions and that's quite scary for a bank because the banks have traditionally approached their business around the product offering or the channel offering so it's going to be um and we can see some of the news between Citibank and uh, Gojek. It's a uh, it's going to be a big um, cat fight for uh, trust and love. And so the banks traditionally have had um, this high ground in terms of trusted financial advisor, um, where it's where it's a place that you grow and hold your money and and um, and it's secure. And the second part of that equation in terms of love is uh, it's a brand that I can can um, relate to that understands my needs, values, and interests. Um, so these are the two parts of the equation in terms of winning with the consumer. Um, and, and banks are approaching it from perhaps uh, they um, 
from this one-sided relationship that they've traditionally had whilst uh, the newer fintechs are approaching it from the consumer perspective and the need perspective. So, um, so that's the battleground and it's quite a double-edged sword uh, considering now the popularity of these ecosystems where it's taken flight for uh, consumers, where you have access to um, many types of services um, and increasingly these super apps have um, consumers access to these consumer touch points. Uh, they know everything about you in terms of all your personal interests and in shopping. And banks are losing some of that ground that they have because um, whilst they may be digitizing their experience and they do have quite a bit of their own customer data, uh, they need to, to uh, demonstrate their relevance in the consumer lifestyle by being part of that ecosystem and cooperating with the um, with some of the, these platforms and super apps and by cooperating, meaning uh, sharing some of the data that they have and sharing some of that information that they have about the customer. So it is a double edged sword and the consumer increasingly, um, you know, there's an expectation where a uh, consumer wants both aspects of it in terms of the experience from the, the super app and neobanks, as well as the ability to seamlessly connect to um, their bank when they are completing a transaction. So what you don't want is um, in that kind of relationship where uh, there's a duality to it, um, the, the super apps then, um, become a parasite in the relationship where uh, the zoo perhaps rely on the, the banks in terms of getting access to, to that data. And it starts to eat into um, your customer's mind share and, and brand share. And there's a big danger to that because uh, banks are, need to play into that strategy to be part of that ecosystem. So how do we, um, how do we get beyond that? Because um, it's a big challenge. Um, and I'm proposing that the banks need to build um, digital equity. What does digital equity mean? So it's really um, creating some strategies around um, demonstrating value to the consumer, utilizing the bank's data in a smart way to create new experiences in the ecosystem. So um, some tips and ideas here of um, some thoughts of how banks could do this is um, banks do have lots of rich raw customer data. It's perhaps the most um, valuable asset that a bank has. And this data is, you know, essential for proposition planning, uh, revenue model design, um, innovation work. So um, I think that you need to keep this as your, your big advantage. Don't, don't give away your golden egg. Um, but what you can do, can do with this information is um, share your aggregate data, utilize uh, this customer profile information in an aggregate way to design new opportunities around that and experiences. So um, you can do that within the bank and also in this ecosystem. A great example of this that exists today is um, OCBC. So in the OCBC banking experience, what they've been able to capture is that through the um, customer data that they have, they've aggregated this in a way to improve the banking experience by providing suggestions. Um, and what I love about this is that it's based on a real consumer insight about their target group. Because um, if you think about it in your target group, if you're saving money or planning for your investments, um, Talking about money in a way is a highly sensitive thing. And um, you do want to know if you're on track with your goals. You want to know track, uh, know if you're on track with your friends. And it's an awkward thing to ask your friends of where they are in terms of their own portfolio planning or their investing. So this, um, this type of experience gives the end user this feeling um, and addresses that that human need that they have um, in terms of 
ensuring that they're keeping up with their peers, um, but also making sure that um, addressing some of the concerns that they have in uh, the goals that they the goals that they may have. And this aggregate data can be applied to other things, um, if you imagine in terms of the relationship that this customer may have with, uh, let's say a utility pro provider to connect that to things like bill spend, um, reducing some of that uh, air, air conditioning bills and how that can connect back to your, your financial goals. So that's an example using aggregate data um, as another way that banks can uh, innovate and stay ahead in this ecosystem is to think beyond the current data that they have and uh, gather new data sets. So um, through the relationships that they have with some of these platform players, um, the platform players have rich meta inf metadata information. Um, and this metadata information can complement uh, your customer profiles and enable you to do um, exciting things with it. Uh, things like seg micro segmentation, personalization offer. I'm sure uh, if people from marketing out there, uh, the, the familiar offer of targeted promotion of getting exactly uh, where you are in the right location with the right offer, the right time with the right brand. Um, these are things that marketers find um, highly attractive and it's the holy grail. Um, but there's other ways to use metadata in a way that can create new revenue opportunities in terms of service. So um, just picking out another example here of AIA, uh, Manulife has their own version of this, but AIA Vitality in the market with Fitbit, uh, what they've done is that they've created a whole program around health and well-being. And I think it's quite exciting because insurance is often quite a boring topic. Nobody <laughs> likes to talk about insurance. In fact, for net promoter scores is one of the categories. It's the lowest, um, the very lowest. Um, nobody really talks about they love their insurance brands, but they found a way to re-engage their consumer in a different way by uh, tapping into this insight to help consumers um, be motivated about staying health, healthy and wealthy, um, healthy and, and, uh, and well. Um, so this program connects your Fitbit, it collects information about your workout, um, there's a gamification element of it, and this is kind of tapping into um, that uh, adrenaline in your brain <laughs> that uh, nudges you towards um, nudges you towards uh, gain positive behaviors and changing some of these behaviors for good, and by setting benchmarks and goals to uh, strive for and achieve for. So. Um, this is quite exciting in terms of both use of metadata, but also going back to connecting to human psychology and behaviors to uh, motivate change and inspire change to engage with the brand in a different way. Um, and the third, uh, a third idea, and this is just around um, trying to sustain ways to uh, participate in this ecosystem is that it's not just about data. Um, I've worked in the market and research industry for years, and often we would um, take human observation and draw assumptions about that to create a product or service offering or do some marketing. But now what's changed is the speed of information that's available. So algorithms are a perfect way to uh, automate learn behaviors um, and draw assumptions and be more, much more effective and, and targeted in delivering new service offerings. So a, a good example about thinking outside of the box, uh, there's a company in China called uh, Smart Finance. Um, they're a, a startup player in the industry that are catering to a whole group of consumers that don't have access to credit. And the beauty of what they've done is that they built a whole credit rating system on um, metadata or some 1200 data points that capture user behaviors. And it's quite successful. They have 1.5 billion 
million loans a month. Um, and some of the, the behaviors that they're tracking in terms of their new credit model of scoring includes things uh, such as measuring how people answer their, their phones, uh, if they're eating takeout food, uh, if they're charging their phone batteries, and if they're um, if they in fact do read and review the user agreement when they sign up for the loan. So these are becoming like the new standards of metrics to evaluate the credit worthiness of a consumer during a loan application. Uh, it's quite incredible and uh, it demonstrates that banks can also be flexible and ad agile in terms of util utilizing some of this metadata uh, for the purpose of creating new products and services. Although in some markets it's highly regulated, China is very extreme in, in this case. And, and the final, the fourth point uh, that I believe in terms of this ecosystem model is that whilst we have great use of data and great methods in terms of um, machine learning and creating algorithms to help fuel this automation is that we do want to deal with the software component. So the software component is the people component in terms, in terms of driving a data-driven culture that all of this just doesn't live with the data scientists who are there dreaming up um, scenarios and possibilities and formulating ideas behind uh, what's what's possible to drive um, and be much more targeted. We want to be able to democratize the use of data um, to a broader group of users um, within the organization. And by doing so, um, we can be, organizations and banks can be much more responsive to facilitate um, this real-time decision-making. So um, a good example here is Better Trader. So um, here it's, it's field on this insight. I, I think it's quite exciting where a Better Trader is tracking a number of things in terms of sentiment data, um, Twitter news, or economic events. Um, but they're sur survey surveillancing these things so that can, they can track anomalies or market manipulation. And so this is a way for them to monitor any illegal trading activities and really take care of their consumers who are, who may be the small investor who's trying to get a, a stake in the game here. So uh, to, leave your, uh, to leave you with some thoughts and summary, I shared um, four thoughts in terms of how um, banks can um, maintain their competitive edge, edge in the ecosystem economy. The first two, um, it's about being uh, selective uh, and quite creative with your data that you have either through aggregating in a way to deliver a new service offering. A second is um, tap into this idea of new data sets and thinking about what that means in terms of translating uh, that metadata into inferencing new consumer behaviors from that and, and decision rules. And the last two in terms of building advantage um, would be finding ways to scale um, the ability of the organization to learn in new ways um, to make sure that uh, it's automated but also lives outside a, a single department. And then from here, uh, through these strategies, instead of having a one-way relationship with these super apps, it can be a, a healthy uh, symbiotic relationship. And, um, and at Tipco, we deal with these types of questions all the time. Um, and we'll be happy to discuss uh, with you further if there's any um, questions today. Thank Thanks you so much. Today. That's great, Carol. I, um, so much information, but well presented. I really appreciate the way you structured it and the ideas. Um, we only have a minute left. Let me check if there are any questions. No questions. Where can people contact you afterwards? Uh, they can go to the, the TIPCO website or I can uh, hang out in some of the forums. 
Okay, right. And also, I think the other point is you've talked a lot about banking, but you also gave some good case studies on the extremes, like what's happening in China and how data is used. And furthermore, also examples in the insurance industry, like you say, an industry that needs to change its relationship as much as the banks. So, yeah. So the question is, it, it was initially retail, but now it seems to be migrating to banks and also to insurance. So do, do you see this trend accelerating? I, I think that um, in, in terms of financial services, um, the ecosystems are taking over. And that means that in terms of if you're a bank or if you're a retailer, that you have to rethink how you approach, how you've, how you've uh, designed your customer journey. And when you're thinking about APIs and you're developing so many of them to connect, um, to connect uh, to customer data or to co connect to systems, is that um, you can certainly build a lot of them, but not of them, not all of them will reap value for you. And so organizations, I think, need to kind of um, look at the the best opportunities that are connected to human insight and is going to give a, an economic benefit, right? Not everything is going to pay off big. And if you diversify too much, you're, you're spreading your eggs too, too thin. Well, thanks very much for the generous examples that you provided and, and have a great day. We have to move on to the next speaker. Thank, Thank you, you, Carol.